Uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, good afternoon for those who are in the afternoon zone, and some may be... Good um, afternoon. Um, so it is a pleasure for me to welcome you to our second uh, in the uh, our series that we are looking at the impact of COVID-19 uh, on African universities. Uh, before I go further, uh, let me ask Justin to explain one feature of today's forum with regards to translation, because one of the presenters will be presenting in French. Justin. Thank you, Prof. Salesa. So good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, I just wanted to briefly mention that Prof. Traore is joining us from Mali and will be speaking French uh, for his presentation. For those who would like to hear his presentation in English, we have an interpreter. Um, on the bottom of your screen, there should be an interpretation button with a globe on it. Just click that and then click English and you should be able to hear his interpretation. Now keep in mind, you'll only need to do this during Prof. Traore's section. Otherwise, you can just keep that feature off. If anyone has any issues with that, please just mention in the chat and we can help you. Thank you. Um, we can get started. Uh, once again, welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, this morning or this afternoon or this evening, depending where you are. Uh, today, we are going to be focusing uh, specifically uh, on the ways in which uh, African universities are responding to COVID-19 in terms of their global and continental partnerships and collaborations. Uh, the first session, of course, uh, we looked at the future, uh, we looked at the global uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, responses and lessons uh, from African universities that are in the AAP uh, partnership, the Alliance for African Partnership. And of course, we will continue this series. Uh, we have four more to go after today. Uh, we'll be looking at very specific areas, including uh, the economic, food, security, and livelihood impact of uh, COVID-19, potential challenges of student rec uh, recruitment in the age of COVID-19, the psychosocial impact of COVID-19 on university faculty and students, and then, of course, uh, look at the impact uh, on Africa uh, in terms of opportunities for partnership and engagement uh, with uh, you know, various uh, sectors uh, in African economies. Uh, today, we are privileged to have four uh, uh, presenters. Uh, I will introduce them in turn. Uh, the first presenter is Steve Hanson uh, from Michigan State University. He's the Associate Provost and Dean of International Studies and Programs at Michigan State. Uh, Dr. Hanson leads MSU's international programming uh, efforts, including multidisciplinary and multi-college research and strategic partnerships um, with higher education institutions abroad. He oversees more than 20 international offices and programs at MSU, guiding research and activities that will positively impact uh, critical global issues, particularly those related to food, health, environment, and education. Under his leadership, ISP has launched several new global strategic initiatives, including the one that is sponsoring today's uh, forum, uh, the Alliance for African Partnership, Asia Nexus, and the Global Youth Advancement Network. Uh, Dr. Hanson's research focuses on risk management with financial contracts and the valuation of financial contracts and assets, such as land. He has taught graduate and undergraduate financial economics and management courses, and his work has been published in leading journals, such as the American Journal of Agricultural Economics and the Journal of Empirical Finance. Uh, Hanson is past chair of the National Association of Agricultural uh, Economics Administrators and a fellow of the Food Systems Leadership Institute. He received his PhD in Agricultural Economics from Iowa State University. Our second speaker, is Charles Arizichukwe Igwe uh, from the University of Nigeria and Suka. Professor Igwe is a social, uh, soil scientist. He holds a PhD from the University of Nigeria and Suka and a diploma from Agricultural University, Norway. Mm -hmm. He was appointed the 15th Chancellor, Vice Chancellor of the University of Nigeria and Suka in June 2019. Prior to his appointment, he served as a two term Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration of the university from 2016 to 2019. 
Professor Igwe is a passionate teacher and researcher who is credited with over 90 scientific publications on, scient uh, on soil conservation and food security. He has authored a number of books and also presented many invited academic papers and keynote addresses at countless national and international fora. Professor Igwe is a fellow of the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in Germany and the Japanese Society for Promotion of Science. His current research interest is in soil organic uh, sequestration and cl uh, climate change mitigation. One of his strategies for success as vice chancellor is to foster new partnerships and collaborations with organizations and institutions across the world. Our third speaker uh, is George Kanyama Piri from the Lilongo University of Agriculture and Natural uh, Resources. Professor George Kanyama Piri has a diploma, BSc, MSc, and PhD certificates from Edgerton University, Florida A&M University, University of California Davis, and Texas A&M University at College Station, Texas, respectively. Professor George Kanyama Piri served three terms as Dean of the Faculty of, the, uh, of uh, Agriculture and two terms as Principal of Bunda College of Agriculture under the University of Malawi. He's currently the Vice Chancellor of Lilongwe University of Agriculture and Natural Resources and Board Chairman for the Regional Universities Forum for Capacity Building in, uh, in Agriculture, popularly known as Rural Forum. He has published 32 articles in free journals, 20 in conference proceedings, 10 in research bulletins, 15 in technical bulletins, three book chapters, contributions, and monograph. He's a recipient of many international awards as a distinguished scholar. Our final speaker is Idrissa Soiba Traole from the University of Letters and Human, uh, Human Sciences of Bamako. Professor Idrissa Traole holds a PhD in Education Sciences uh, in, uh, from 2009 in France. He has had a rich career in which he has served in various administrative positions, including as head of department, deputy vice chancellor, and he has been chancellor since 2019. In addition to his administrative duties, Professor Traore lectures in many institutions, including University of Letters and Human Sciences, Catholic University of Bamako. He has written several research papers on school governance, violence in the schools, socioeconomic mediation, etc. In terms of community involvement, Professor Traore is a member of UNESCO clubs and several non-governmental organizations. The way we are going to conduct the forum uh, is that the, each presenter will have 10 minutes and all of you will have a, an opportunity to either use the chat function to make your comments or to use the Q&A function to raise questions that the uh, panelists can respond later. We have also received questions in advance that panelists will try to address. Let me conclude the uh, introduction by simply making a few brief remarks about today's forum. Uh, as I said, the forum is on global and continental partnerships and collaborations in higher education. This is a very important issue for African universities uh, in general, and of course, particularly critical as we face and try to navigate through the uh, COVID-19 uh, pan pandemic. Let me just make uh, three uh, preliminary remarks that there, there are, of course, different levels of partnerships, different types of partnerships, and of course, there are uh, certain challenges that partnerships bring that all of us have to be mindful of. In terms of levels of partnerships, uh, you know, they, they are, of course, intra-institutional partnerships that are critical to think about. Uh, that is interdisciplinary and intra-professional um, uh, interprofessional collaborations within universities. And secondly, of course, inter-institutional partnerships at national, regional, and global levels. With regards to types of uh, partnerships that we have to be mindful of, uh, one is, of course, partnerships with other universities. Secondly, partnerships with regulatory agencies, uh, that is, those people who regulate or who uh, give us accreditation, the system regulators. Uh, for example, in Kenya, the Commission for Investor Education. And then, of course, there are the professional regulators in various fields, in engineering, in law, uh, medicine, and so on and so forth. And then thirdly, partnerships with government, with national, county, or provincial governments, depending on the political 
geography of different countries. And then fourth, partnerships with private sector, local and international companies. Uh, and we all know PPPs, uh, private public partnerships have become increasingly important for our investors. Uh, the traditional area of focus being of course, uh, in terms of infrastructure. But now there is need also to think of these partnerships in terms of research and innovation. And then fifth, are partnerships with international and intergovernmental agencies, the world banks of this world, the African development banks of this world, the regional economic communities of this world. Uh, these are important partnerships for us as we navigate this crisis, but also as we, uh, of course, try to strengthen our capacities in contributing to society. And then uh, six is community organizations and civil society partnerships. And then seventh, uh, you know, philanthropic organizations and private donors for institutional support, uh, which of course are critical as we think of uh, the challenges we face with COVID-19. These encompass technological infrastructure support, scholarships and other forms of student support, for example, in terms of access to electronic devices and access to the internet. And then of course, research support, both for biomedical and socioeconomic uh, research that is important as we navigate this crisis, but also in our usual way of functioning as knowledge producing institutions. And then of course, the issue of how universities with their innovations, how those innovations can be upscaled by working closely uh, with uh, philanthropic organizations, the private sector and others. Partnerships bring their own challenges. Uh, there are three that uh, perhaps one can uh, think about. Uh, and that is, there are three types of partnerships in terms of, one is paternalistic partnerships that tend to be exploitative and unequal. Uh, Africa's global partnerships have been uh, of this nature, whether the level of governments or institutions, including universities, in which uh, Africa uh, tends to be on the receiving end and not necessarily, uh, you know, uh, fronting its own agenda or its own interests. So those kind of paternalistic partnerships are uh, things that we need to guard against. And at a moment like this, uh, we need to think very carefully about that. Secondly, are what I call principled partnerships in which there is a mutuality of interests and purpose. Uh, and and uh, of course, it, this can be for long term. And we have lots of examples of those as well. And then what I call pragmatic partnerships that tend to be situational and utilitarian for both parties, either of a project or a particular issue. And again, uh, these are, uh, you know, things that we have all experienced in one way or the other. In conclusion, it is important for us as we think of uh, global and continental partnerships and collaborations in the era of uh, COVID-19 and after COVID-19 uh, to think some of these questions. What kind of partnerships are emerging in Africa for universities because of COVID-19? For example, in terms of research collaboration, student teaching and learning, and mobilities of people, programs, and curricula. Secondly, how can new forms of collaboration emerge out of COVID-19 that transform traditional paternalistic and unequal modes of North-South collaboration? Finally, how will COVID-19 affect the perennial struggle for African universities to balance the enduring demands of internationalization and indigenization in the models of institutional organization, pedagogical delivery, research practices, and patterns of public service and engagements. Uh, with those introductory remarks, I would like to uh, welcome our panelists, beginning uh, with uh, Steve uh, Hanson from Michigan State University. Uh, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Zadlaza. Uh, the, uh, your, your framework is, is, is very useful, and let me try to touch on some of the, the issues you've raised around levels and types of partnerships and some of the, the challenges and opportunities that we face here. And uh, I'll, I'll first begin with, I think, partnerships before COVID, and then I'll switch to talk about partnerships uh, post-COVID. Um, Michigan State's uh, journey on global partnerships really began 60 years ago when uh, our president at the time, John Hanna, made a commitment to use the knowledge and the technologies we create in partnership with others around the world to solve problems. And he did something important right away as he began to send our faculty 
overseas so that they would better understand the, the people and the problems in the places where we work. And uh, uh, Vice Chancellor Igwe, one of the first places he sent our, our faculty was to West Africa, where they partnered with, with colleagues to help establish the first land-grant university on the continent, the University of Nigeria and in Nsuka. <clears throat> And this set the stage for what's been six decades of engagement and partnership uh, across Africa. And on the, on the right hand side there is a picture of John Hanna and uh, Vice Chancellor uh, Zaleza, this is a picture of Hanna in 1986, 26 years later uh, in, in Kenya at a, with an MSU alumni group there. And uh, over time, this engagement has really helped to shape and inform our approach to uh, innovating global solutions. And it's, it's a three-pronged approach, uh, bringing together the thematic knowledge that we, that we have together with regional expertise and global partnerships. Because we found that when we can bring those three things together, that's when we create global innovations and solutions with lasting impact. And it's in this spirit that uh, five years ago, we began to work with uh, African leaders to co-create what today has become the Alliance for African Partnerships. And this is an initiative that recognizes the capacity and the strengths of African-based institutions and creates African-led partnerships to help solve Africa's most pressing problems. Its, its goal is really to, to innovate partnerships that will in turn lead to innovative solutions and will create impact beyond the boundaries of the academy at the levels of policy as well as implementation on the ground in the places where we work. And we believe that the values that are embedded in AAP are really laying the foundation for how engagement will take place in and across the continent for the next generation. <clears throat> Let me talk uh, post COVID now, how, how, how we believe COVID will, will impact partnerships. And let me talk about first partnerships and collaborations and the things that, that I don't think will change. And uh, let me first mention just some examples of some of the most pressing problems that we faced before COVID-19. Rural to urban migration, food deserts, uh, health impacts from, from poor water quality, the, the disproportionate impacts of things like climate change and infectious disease on our poor and our underrepresented groups, growing income inequality, the, the challenges we have in providing the youth of today with the scientific, technical, and entrepreneurial skills that they need to access jobs and to create jobs. And I wanna make two points here. First is that um, <clears throat> these issues were here and were major issues before COVID-19, and they're gonna to continue to be major issues after COVID-19. And the second point I wanna make is, you, you might think I'm talking about issues that, that uh, you're facing in one of many African countries, but I'm actually talking about the major issues that we're facing right here in my home state of Michigan, <clears throat> in the United States and, and really across the United States. So the point being that, that these problems look the same no matter where we're at. The context may be different, but these are, are global problems. <clears throat> so, we, so we have to continue to attack these things through some version of the themes, regions, and relationships uh, approach. And what I wanna focus on here is the relationship piece of this. I, I listened to the first dialogue series and, and, uh, and, and, and the vice chancellor's opening comments we're hearing a lot of things about the, the nature of relationships here and, and the level and types and the challenges. And I wanna focus my comments on three parts, uh, partnerships, teams, and platforms. On the partnership piece, uh, there, there's this issue of um, are global partnerships important? Should we have, or should we have more local partnerships? And the answer is yes. Are global partnerships important? Uh, absolutely, why? Because these problems, they, they look the same no matter where we're at even though there, there may be a, a local context. But the, these, these problems are often globally connected. And most importantly, the best ideas and the best innovations don't know borders. So we need to take those solutions wherever we can find them around the world. Uh, what about local partnerships, uh, regional partnerships, South-South partnerships? Uh, absolutely critical because there is a local context to these problems. And perhaps most importantly, the solutions have to be implemented locally. Teams, uh, two aspects I wanna mention here, multidisciplinary teams and multi-sectoral teams. Uh, multidisciplinary dis teams are critically important and universities bring a powerful ability to target multi-disciplines 
collectively on these complex problems that we face. Nobody else can bring that, that ability that, that university and higher education institutions can bring. But the, the, most, the, the largest impacts come from multi-sectoral teams. And why is that? Well, you know, universities are good at, at innovating, they're good at piloting and prototyping, they're good at measuring impacts, but the private sector is much better at implementation and much better at scale. Now the third piece here, <laughs> platforms or, or really problems, uh, problem-based approaches. And, and my point's gonna be here that, that we know the value of partnerships and teams and we often try to push teams and partnerships together because we, we know how impactful they can be, but that often doesn't work just to try to, to push them together. What works better is to pull them towards a problem. And when we can pull partnerships and teams in an aligned way towards problems, that's where, that's where the magic happens. That's where we create the real impact. And the best example I can give you is COVID-19 situation we have right now. That is pulling teams together, multi-sectoral teams, multidisciplinary teams. It's pulling local, regional, continental, and global partnerships all together in an aligned way, in a powerful way to tackle that problem. So my hope is that we learn from that, and when we come out the other side of COVID, that we bring this same problem-orientated whole approach to these other problems that we'll, that we'll continue to face post-COVID. Let me now switch to things that I think are going to change uh, post-COVID. And I think we'll be looking at an accelerated transformation and something that I am calling the, the COVID leap. And, and let me talk about why. And I think there's both a push factor and a pull factor here. And the, the push factor is because COVID is going to impact the way we, we get together, the way we gather, our ability to travel and so on. And, and a lot of this will be health and safety related. A lot of it will be for the foreseeable future will be part of the economic impacts that are created from COVID. So that is gonna, that's gonna, those type of factors are gonna push change. But there's a pull factor here, and uh, that's really the, 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 the rapid adoption of technology and, and going virtual and really our version of the fourth industrial revolution that's, that's uh, I think, going to be accelerated uh, upon us. And so we're, you know, we're experimenting like crazy. We're, we're innovating. Uh, you know, I, I look at what's happening even at just Michigan State where we're, you know, we're learning how to do online advising and, and chat rooms. We're doing telehealth support. We're developing virtual communities virtual cross-cultural experiences, better, better information flows to students and to their parents. We're, we're innovating online teaching. We're, we're actually, you know, we're, we're doing virtual labs and virtual reality labs. So you can sit at your desk and turn a dial um, in a lab halfway across the world and get instant data feedback on this. So, so all these things are happening literally overnight in an accelerated pace. They're not gonna replace for in-person experiences, but they're gonna enhance what we do when we come out the other side of COVID. Last thing I'll mention is, is innovative. I think we're going to see acceleration in, in innovative things like educational pathways. And at Michigan State University, we have six to 8,000 international students a, a year that, that come. They typically spend four to five years. And, and it's great. It's great for MSU. It's great for these students. But it's often expensive. And it's pulling the best students from their home institutions to another institution. And sometimes they don't find their way back home. So we're, we, before COVID, we were piloting dual degree programs. And I'll give you an example of one that was scheduled to launch this fall. We're developing two year, with our partner, developing parallel two year curriculums that, that meet each of our requirements the first two years. So you can take it at either home institution. The third year is an online experience with cohorts of students from both institutions. And why students are doing that online experience, they can have a, an internship experience at home or anywhere in the world. The fourth year is an immersion experience uh, that, that they take away and uh, with a pathway into graduate school or back into employment at, at the home country. So I think we're gonna see a real acceleration of these kinds of hybrid experiences. None of this is gonna be smooth. It's gonna highlight diversity, equity, and inclusion issues around uh, things like infrastructure and access. But, I, but I'm hopeful, you know, we'll, we'll, have, we'll have new policy priorities and things going forward. And I'm hopeful that these kinds of dialogues as well as efforts like the Alliance for African Partnerships can, can help us navigate our way through this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, Steve has shared with us uh, MSU's long history of international partnerships, including, of course, with African universities uh, in Nigeria, in uh, Kenya, and uh, uh, 
uh, elsewhere on the continent. Uh, he also shared with us the, the anchors of their different types of partnerships uh, that they have established over the years, the lessons they have learned from them and how they have tried to improve uh, the partnerships. And then of course, uh, he um, shared with us issues that will persist uh, even after COVID-19 uh, that uh, we as investors and certainly for them as MSU, they are focused on uh, issues of climate change, issues of food security, uh, youth employability and all those uh, issues will still be there after COVID-19. However, he also shared with us uh, things that will change uh, because of COVID-19, uh, travel and safety issues, uh, technology uh, and going virtual. He gave examples from their own investors, which all of us are also trying to do in different ways. And of course, the development of innovative pathways uh, in terms of uh, collaborations. Uh, he mentioned the dual degree program, uh, parallel uh, programs, online ex uh, ex uh, experience, immersion, and so on and so forth. All of which uh, he concluded needed uh, policy intervention and continued uh, dialogue among institutions so that we learn from each other. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Steve. Uh, now we'll move to Professor Igwe. Thank you very much. Uh... Uh, first of all, let me uh, good every person, uh, both the participants and their colleagues uh, presenting. Uh, I wish to appreciate AAP for giving us this opportunity to dialogue, uh, to participate in the dialogue series on uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, please permit me to give a brief uh, introduction of University of Nigeria and Stoka, otherwise known as UNN. Uh, UNN is the first indigenous university of Nigeria. It was uh, established during uh, the celebration for our independence in 1960. And uh, of course, you had uh, Steve uh, mention that uh, at inception, MSU mentored the University of Nigeria. And presently, we have three campuses and um, with a student population of uh, over 60,000. Uh, university of Nigeria, UNN, was ab initio structured as a residential university. Uh, but presently, we have only 10,000 students in the halls of residence. We have a functional center for distance learning, but physical attendance in classes is the main method of instruction in our campuses. What have we done? You know, uh, to have uh, well, the action we've taken so far against the spread of COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we've provided running water and uh, soap for washing of hands, even sanitizers at uh, entrances of uh, offices and uh, classrooms and other public places. We've postponed events that involve crowd. These include our matriculation ceremony, convocation ceremony, and uh, AGM of uh, AAP that would have taken place in Nigeria uh, in the month of March, and we were to host it. And uh, we hope uh, that when normalcy returns, and uh, that it will return very soon, that we'll be able to organize our 60th anniversary, which is coming up on the, uh, 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 in October this year as planned. We have also complied with the uh, federal government directive to close schools and offices. We are staff to work from home where necessary and uh, we have uh, resorted to remote through virtual meetings, just like we are having now. In addition, we have hosted a number of awareness programs you know, on radio and, uh, and our public relations office releases weekly bulletins on, on the pandemic. What have we as a university contributed? Uh, to the fight against COVID-19. The University Medical Center and the Teaching Hospital are involved in COVID-19 surveillance. Presently, our staff are members of the Ministerial Committee on COVID-19. Our staff also are involved with sample collection for testing in Enugu State, where our university is located. Our Department of Science and Laboratory Technology is producing hand sanitizers, and uh, if you're looking at me now, I have a, I have a, a specimen of what the department has produced as uh, sanitizer, and uh, every staff is using it. And uh, also, our Department of uh, Vocational Technical Education 
is also is also producing mass face mass. I have some specimens here with even the crest of University of Nigeria now different varieties of a face mask and also we are producing we are producing personal protection equipment for clinicians in the front in the front lines because you know this uh, facility is very scarce and uh, not uh, uh, not every every hospital can afford it now and um, because of the pandemic we've tried to conceptualize some research uh, ideas and I'm ready and I'm happy to share these ideas with you and the ideas are or the co research concepts are level of awareness of COVID-19 pandemic and degree of compliance with the precautionary directives Two, the impact of lockdown on small businesses family income and harmony three the impact of government palliative on the welfare of citizens for gender issues arising from the pandemic and the lockdown. Five, prevalence of risk factors to, to, for severe illness due to COVID-19. Six, implications of the pandemic for food security. Seven, exploration of biodiversity, which is abound in our environment for antiviral and the immune boosting agents. Eight, strategies for managing the student population in the post-pandemic era. Let me give you an overview of the existing collaborations which we've been engaged in the University of Nigeria. UNN has entered into over 100 national, continental, and global partnerships and the collaborations. The, institutions collab the institutional co collaborations offer opportunities for joint research and grant applications, staff and student exchanges, as well as sharing of curriculum, resources, resources and experiences. We also have numerous partnerships with private sectors, including telecommunication companies and banks. Some of these companies offer us their services at a special rates. I don't need to mention them now, uh, but uh, the telecommunications company in Nigeria do assist us in this uh, aspect. And how do we intend to collaborate post-pandemic, pandemic, pandemic uh, which is very, very important. And we intend to, one, retain the existing partnerships and collaborations. Two, seek new partnerships, especially those that can help us address the post-pandemic challenges. Three, pursue new South South. exploit this partnership in dealing with the challenges posed by the pandemic. Do we have challenges? Yes, the challenges we expect from the, expect, uh, from, we expect from the post pandemic are managing the student population in classrooms and hostels. You can see at the inception, we had you know, residential uh, 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 facilities, but now only 10,000 are accommodated, and this is going to pose challenges. Upgrading ICT facilities and infrastructures for distance learning, addressing the issues of data access and affordability, migration and of more courses to e-learning and distant learning platforms, additional training of staff on new ICT skills, and providing psychosocial support to staff and students. In conclusion, therefore, COVID-19 poses some common challenges to universities, especially managing population and uh, improving technology. This requires extra funding and strategic thinking. Some universities may be better equipped to deal with uh, these challenges, except, I mean, uh, within the continent. However, the challenges of availability and affordability of requisite technology, e.g., Data access and affordability are common to African universities. Finally, as, member, as members of AAP, I hope we and strategies as we face this common enemy called COVID-19. Thank you for listening. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Igwe, uh, for those uh, uh, remarks and sharing with us the experience of uh, University of Nigeria and SUCA 
uh, in terms of its brief history um, and as well as uh, some of its key features, including the number of students. And uh, we also appreciated learning from you the actions that you have undertaken uh, immediately to uh, you know, intervene uh, both in your own institutions, but also contribute uh, to society at large uh, in dealing with the immediate uh, effects of COVID-19. Um, and these, of course, resonate with what many universities, uh, not only in Nigeria, but also across Africa and around the world, uh, you know, doing. Uh, it was uh, gratifying to learn about the, uh, you know, what you're trying to do in terms of contributing to society, in terms of uh, uh, innovations uh, uh, and uh, certain um, things uh, like, you know, producing masks, sanitizers, personal protection equipment, and so on and so forth. Uh, on the collaboration, uh, it was uh, also good for us to learn uh, that uh, you have a very extensive range of partners, uh, more than a hundred national, uh, continental, and global collaborations, uh, and the areas that you focus on, uh, you know, uh, ones that uh, many of our institutions uh, try to do, and it was good to learn from you, uh, focusing uh, on uh, joint research, uh, private sector, um, collaborations in terms of uh, the telecommunication companies and banks and so on and so forth, and that uh, you are not only seeking to retain, but also develop new partnerships. Uh, and uh, you're very keen to pursue uh, new South-South uh, partnerships. And of course, uh, you seek to do that in managing uh, all sorts of issues uh, with regards to student issues, uh, issues of data access and affordability, uh, the development of e-learning platforms and training uh, for uh, you know faculty as well as uh, students to use these new platforms and of course all these require uh, extra funding uh, which uh, of course many of our investors by themselves cannot generate uh, but they need to have collaborations we'll have a special session of course uh, dealing with issues of finances in more detail in one of the forums, but it was good to uh, begin raising some of these issues. And finally, uh, it was uh, interesting to learn from you uh, the research uh, that you're doing, uh, both to uh, uh, deal with the current crisis, but also uh, in contributing to society uh, on SMEs, small medium enterprises, family well being, gender issues, food security, biodiversity, uh, data issues, um, data management, and so on. Uh, those are, of course, all important issues as we enter this new uh, era. Um, so once again, thank you for that presentation. Uh, we will have, I'm sure, some questions and an opportunity for you to elaborate. Uh, our next speaker is Professor Piri, Kanyama Piri. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I hope I can be, uh, I'm being heard. Uh, let me begin by indicating that we are a small university, a uh, state public university in Malawi called the Rilongo University of Agriculture and Natural Resources. Currently, we have a population of over 13,000 students, 60 programs, and um, uh, three campuses. We are very pleased to be part of uh, this dialogue in the sense that we are also equally affected by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So our presentation, therefore, will focus on what impact we have had from the uh, pandemic and also how to explore opportunities with the sister campuses sister universities within the um, AAP, and also how to uh, move forward in our collaboration. In terms of experiences and opportunities, we have been affected by the pandemic in the sense that we were caught unawares with the uh, without elaborate and functional ICT infrastructure. We also have, uh, have had students 
that not all of them have laptops, so this is also a challenge. Therefore, limited access to internet data. Our campus or campuses experience frequent interruption of electricity, uh, and this is even worse when the students are in the rural areas, as it has happened now that all the undergraduate students are being sent home. Um, so there, the study environment is not uh, conducive to learning. Uh, at the faculty level, we have infrastructure challenges. As I did indicate later, limited ICT network, as well as bandwidth, uh, serious, uh, serious uh, challenges. And also, a number of our faculty members are not quite uh, conversant with the online or virtual learning. Uh, capability. And also the university policies and regulations uh, at the moment were not uh, planned for online teaching in a majority of ways. But let me also hasten to add that by virtue of the fact that the students have gone uh, home, it means that the, our source of revenue, which comes from fees and tuition, has also been drastically affected. So we are really operating from a very limited budget frame. Uh, in terms of experiences and opportunities for collaboration as a continuation, we would like to improve on the ICT, as is the case with other African countries, specifically to build capacity and develop regulatory frameworks to ensure that online, online learning is of quality. Uh, also, we envisage that the AAP will offer online courses, and this was assured by the first speaker um, for our faculty members uh, to do instruction online, particularly when it comes to interruptions like the ones we have now. We are hoping that the uh, High Education Student Loan Board will assist us to improve on our internet, particularly with the supply of gadgets. Uh, government could also include university learning sites uh, within the um, framework. The post-COVID-19 inclusion of online instruction for generic programs will definitely, if, if done and achieved, in, improve the access to education. Let me also emphasize here or repeat that the AAP universities <coughs> could offer those <coughs> modules. <coughs> Let me also touch on the opportunities for collaboration. Uh, the pandemic so far has exposed need to deepen triangular cooperation in terms of south to south and north to south, um, as well as public and private. For example, this is what is happening. <coughs> Dr. Franz Sonopo from University of Victoria has helped us to review our curriculum so that it is in tune with um, um, the current realities. Let me also add <clears throat> that Makere University is assisting us with the Faculty of Written and Medicine program, the special teachers, but we are also taking advantage of um, AAP by seeking the support from the University of Nigeria uh, we were hoping that they will provide us with the dean of faculty of veterinary medicine. We also are cognizant of the fact that Luana's cooperation with the Michigan State of University spans a period of 40 years. We have worked a lot in so many areas, but I think we need this cooperation even more now that we have the challenge in our hands. 
Um, let me also add that within the African region, the University of Stellenbosch has also assisted us with the postdoctoral forms of research. Let me talk a little bit about the opportunities for collaboration in the area of joint programs. We are focusing on achieving metrics through research and activities for institutional ranking. There's also need to focus on the common good outcomes. Uh, here I can give examples of cooperation on research on the cure of COVID-19 and also efficiency of food systems in the advent of this pandemic. Uh, there has been a heavy dependence on the travel, which now is no longer uh, practical. Um, as a result, five students from Malawi from, who were supposed to enroll at the Michigan State University have failed to do so because of the COVID-19. And so this calls for the urgent need to devise means of communicating virtual, uh, which I think um, is our colleague, uh, colleagues at MSU are uh, capable of uh, assisting. Therefore, most of the training needs to take place in Africa with the uh, improvement in the communication and contact with other universities. Let me also talk a little bit about the collaboration with the public sector. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic has transcended throughout the health sector and our university faculties are taking part and will continue to do so, as well as sister universities within the country. The effects and implications of COVID-19 are evolving fast in, in the country, as is the case throughout the continent and the world. And universities cannot afford to conduct business and, as usual. Pre-COVID-19, we have to face realities. There's need to fast track responses and processes. There's need to capture data and provide feedback for the same. What I would like to emphasize is that we need research that can produce results, that can, be, can produce outputs. The, we, talking about the public sector again, the government is searching for solutions, just as the investors are also searching for the same solutions. We are reaching out to the government to see where we can be of assistance. For example, uh, participation in the COVID-19 has taken the place of uh, production of sanitizers. We have also uh, offered our services in terms of uh, the testing facilities, the PCR, which is the domicile at the Bunda College of Agriculture. We also envisage partnering with development partners and government uh, agencies in capturing data uh, that will be relevant. Let me talk about partnership with the private sector. Uh, cooperation with the private sector is essential in order to build capacities. For example, we have received support from the National Oil Company of Malawi uh, and also the Japanese Tobacco International uh, towards the acquisition of facilities for COVID testing. There we also envisage the private pet, uh, partner uh, sector to partner with investors in the commercialization of relevant technologies. And here I can give an example of basic science department. Which uh, Professor Piri, uh, Piri uh, if you don't yes. mind, um, you know, you, uh, I think there'll be questions uh, in which okay. you can share some of those yeah. examples, uh, if you can um, conclude. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, yes, let me conclude by talking about future cooperation. We envisage international cooperation will be important and also for deeper partnerships with the international as well as national institutions that I've already mentioned. 
Uh, finally, let me uh, mention that Luana, like many other investors, were caught off guard by this global pandemic and that ICT capacity in the, in the university uh, leaves a lot to be desired and that we have to forge partnerships in order to solve these problems. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Kanyama Piri shared with us uh, extensively the, uh, the background of the University of Malawi, as well as uh, partnerships with the universities in the AAP and the, their experiences uh, and opportunities that they have seized uh, in responding to COVID-19. Uh, he also shared with us some of the infrastructural challenges that all of us have faced in one way or the other, the issue of ICT and bandwidth, uh, bandwidth uh, faculty preparedness, uh, the question of university policies and regulations, and of course the budgetary implications uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19. Uh, and then uh, he shared with us uh, the various collaborations uh, that uh, the university has developed uh, with other universities, the University of Pretoria, Makarere, Nigeria and Suka, MSU, Stellenbosch, and so on and so forth, uh, and uh, the areas in which uh, these collaborations have uh, focused on, including, of course, trying to build ICT capacity, uh, training for faculty uh, on online instruction and assessment, uh, and also they have uh, been working with the public sector uh, in terms of uh, trying to provide research uh, and data for uh, data-driven decision-making, and also, of course, trying to provide facilities for use in uh, mitigation of uh, COVID-19. And uh, he also shared with us their collaborations with uh, development partners, with the private sector, all of them, again, focused on some critical issues uh, of infrastructure, of research, and of course, dealing with uh, uh, continued problems of Malawi and other societies on the continent, including uh, the emergency food systems and so on and so forth. So once again, uh, Professor Kanyama Piri, thank you very much for sharing the experience of your university. Um, last but not least, uh, Professor Traore uh, will share with us uh, the experience of his university. He'll be speaking in French and uh, there will be translation as we heard at the beginning. So if you go to your right hand side, uh, there is a, a, a kind of global map and which is uh, interpretation. So click on English if you are English speaking. And of course, if you are French speaking, click on the French. Thank you, uh, Professor Traore. Uh, please continue. Okay. <clears throat> uh, merci beaucoup. Je voudrais commencer par cette expression merci qui est l'expression uh, dans toutes nos langues pour exprimer sa satisfaction par rapport à une situation bien déterminée comme une situation situation such as Merci une fois de plus. Je vais commencer ma uh, like présentation uh, je vais commencer mon intervention par une présentation de l'université des lettres uh, des sciences humaines et de de l'université jeune et qui est focalisé sur les sciences sociales et les langues. Cette université comprend deux facultés, la faculté des lettres et des sciences humaines, la, la faculté des lettres et des sciences du langage, plutôt, la faculté des sciences humaines et des sciences de l'éducation. Il, il y a deux instituts, l'Institut universitaire de technologie, qui s'occupe des métiers de communication, d'archivage et aussi euh, tout ce qui est relatif à la théâtrologie. Et le dernier institut, c'est l'Institut Confucius. L'Institut Confucius s'occupe de la langue chinoise et de la culture chinoise. Notre université a 24 000 étudiants et 245 enseignants-chercheurs donc, euh, le tout appuyé par un personnel administratif. Ils sont loués. Sur ce plan-là, c'est ce qu'on peut signaler. Nous souffrons également d'une insuffisance des équipements, surtout euh, des ordinateurs. 
en tout cas, j'allais dire simplement dans l'ensemble des tics. Il y a une insuffisance des ressources humaines, tant en quantité qu'en qualité. Et aussi une insuffisance des ressources financières. Donc, vous pouvez comprendre que le Mali est un pays pauvre et cette pauvreté se reflète bien entendu sur l'université. Maintenant, l'impact du COVID-19 sur l'université. Je tiens à rappeler quand même que le Mali connaît une situation de crise depuis 2012, ce qui affecte tous les secteurs d'activité, notamment l'éducation. Et par rapport à la COVID-19, il semble qu'on doit dire comme ça, c'est l'Académie française qui a décidé ainsi, la COVID-19, ça se dit comme ça. Voilà. Donc, il y a un, une incapacité quand même à respecter toutes les mesures barrières ici. Euh, dans l'ensemble, hein, euh, même au-delà de l'université, les gens euh, mettent en cause l'existence même, n'est-ce pas, de la COVID-19. Aujourd'hui, nous sommes confrontés à, à une fermeture des campus et à un arrêt total, n'est-ce pas, des activités pédagogiques. Voilà. Un autre impact de la COVID-19 sur l'université, c'est la faible connectivité à l'Internet, le coût élevé, n'est-ce pas, de l'Internet, nous allons revenir sur tout ça, le coût élevé également des TIC. Le, le boulot d'étanglement, reste la coupure d'électricité qui est très fréquente. Maintenant, comment nous faisons pour faire face, n'est-ce pas, à l'impact de la COVID-19? Un, un travail que nous avons mené sur le plan pratique, c'est vraiment la publication, n'est-ce pas, de ce, de ce monument qui est une sorte d'affiche L'affiche a été réalisée ici par les enseignants de l'UIT. Donc, l'affiche est une action, n'est-ce pas, de sensibilisation qui montre, n'est-ce pas, ce qui doit être fait. Lavage des mains, l'arrêt des meetings et des regroupements, n'est-ce pas, de plus de 50 personnes, des ateliers, voilà, et des colloques. Donc, vous voyez, il y a des gens qui sont sur euh, l'affiche et qui sont... Euh, avec euh, des masques. Voilà. Donc ça, c'est notre contribution. Voilà. C'est une de nos contributions quand même dans le cadre de la lutte contre euh, la COVID-19. Bien. Nous sommes en train également de former les enseignants pour la mise en ligne des cours, parce que ce travail-là a commencé par un travail de sensibilisation. Euh, nous avons demandé de fournir la liste, n'est-ce pas, des enseignants pour qu'ils soient formés très rapidement à la mise en ligne des cours. Notre objectif, c'est d'arriver rapidement à l'établissement, n'est-ce pas, d'une plateforme digitale qui, au-delà de celle qui a été donnée par le ministère, va permettre, n'est-ce pas, va nous permettre d'innover en matière de mise en ligne des cours. Nous travaillons, nous avons commencé à travailler dans ce sens-là. Nous sommes aussi dans la perspective de négocier le coût de l'Internet pour que, les étudiants puissent avoir accès à ces plateformes-là. Il y a aussi une négociation du coût du matériel et du matériel surtout d'éthique. Ce qui est innovant aussi ici, c'est que nous insistons beaucoup sur le respect de toutes les mesures barrières. Vous avez constaté cela avec l'affiche. Nous nous insistons aussi sur le lavage des mains. Il y a des seaux qui sont installés partout au niveau de l'université. Et des solutions hydroalcooliques, il y en a une à côté de moi, sont, sont au niveau, n'est-ce pas, pratiquement de tous les bureaux. Parce que les classes sont fermées, mais nous protégeons, n'est-ce pas, les enseignants et le personnel administratif. Voilà. Nous insistons aussi sur le port obligatoire des masques. Mais dans l'ensemble, notre rêve par rapport à cette COVID-19, euh, c'est d'arriver à cette situation où aucun étudiant ne serait à la traîne, en tout cas par rapport à l'usage euh, d'éthique. Maintenant, les stratégies. 
pour le futur. Très rapidement, nous, nous travaillons dans le cadre, n'est-ce pas, du partenariat, tant au niveau local qu'au niveau régional et international. Nous, sommes, nous mutualisons avec l'Université des sciences, des techniques et des technologies, l'atelier Louban. Cet atelier-là va permettre, et c'est avec deux autres universités chinoises, il faut que je précise ça, donc au niveau de cet atelier, les Chinois vont nous aider très rapidement, n'est-ce pas, à envoyer les remèdes qu'ils ont pu trouver, en tout cas par rapport à cette COVID-19. Je rappelle que l'atelier Louban est, est axé sur euh, la médecine traditionnelle chinoise et malienne. Nous nous rentrons, il ne faut pas que ça vous étonne, nous rentrons à travers, n'est-ce pas, l'anthropologie de la santé. Il y a un aspect qui est fondé sur le renforcement d'éthique, de la culture d'éthique. Nous, nous avons sollicité des partenaires pour euh, l'acquisition des équipements. Nous en avons reçu la semaine dernière à travers, n'est-ce pas, le PADES. Et nous allons euh, nous appuyer beaucoup, n'est-ce pas, sur... Nous allons beaucoup développer, n'est-ce pas, la formation à ce niveau-là. Voilà. Un, un aspect aussi important, c'est la formation, n'est-ce pas, en anglais au niveau de la communauté universitaire. Donc, cette formation va commencer. Euh, et ça va me permettre, chers collègues, la prochaine fois de parler en anglais. Et je serai très heureux de le faire. Voilà. Il y aura une diversification également des sources de financement. Voilà, et cette diversification s'appuie beaucoup plus, n'est-ce pas, sur le développement des ressources propres. Nous avons sollicité également la construction des infrastructures. Notre partenaire est l'État à ce niveau-là, qui nous a accordé déjà une aide pour la construction, n'est-ce pas, de six salles de classe. Cette aide va continuer l'année prochaine avec six autres salles de classe de 100 places. Et nous allons... Nous comptons également valoriser surtout la recherche sur le plan social en ce qui concerne ces résultats. Ces résultats vont permettre, par rapport à la COVID-19, d'avoir des informations essentielles et de partager les logiques et les représentations des populations vis-à-vis -vis de cette maladie. Et à, terme, à terme, nous pensons que cette COVID-19 va nous amener, nous, nous obliger à changer nos pratiques et stratégies pédagogiques et nous pencher absolument sur l'usage accru des, des TIC dans l'enseignement. Nous l'avons commencé à, à, à petites gouttes, mais aujourd'hui nous sommes conscients qu'il faut aller, n'est-ce pas, vers cet usage accru. Nous allons aussi développer le partenariat au niveau multilatéral pour nous approprier des meilleures pratiques. Et en nous appropriant, n'est-ce pas, des meilleures pratiques, nous allons également mener des réflexions sur la possibilité d'inventer surtout notre propre voie par rapport, n'est-ce pas, à cette nouvelle situation. Je vous remercie. Uh, thank you, Professor Traore, for, uh, uh, for sharing with us the uh, measures that your university is taking uh, both to deal with uh, immediate challenges of COVID-19, but also uh, in terms of about the future. Uh, you shared with us uh, you know, the, uh, the size and nature of the university and the challenges the investor has faced. Uh, in dealing with COVID-19, uh, some of those, of course, uh, being uh, common challenges among my investors, a lack of uh, infrastructure, adequate infrastructure and equipment, uh, the whole question of the type of, uh, of internet, uh, the challenges of power, electricity, which are, of course, not over the control of investors, uh, but we do operate in that environment. And of course, the issue of finances uh, to deal with some of these challenges. And, um, you know, what you have tried to do uh, in terms of digital platforms, uh, you know, negotiating costs uh, with internet companies and so on. And then in terms of partnerships for the future, I uh, shared with us funds for enhancing ICT infrastructure, uh, making for training in English, diversification 
also uh, construction of infrastructure and of course the value uh, to ongoing research. So once again, thank you for sharing those experiences. Uh, we'll now open the conversation, uh, questions and uh, answers. Um, I've been looking at some of the uh, uh, questions that have been asked on the Q&A. As I said earlier, we have also received uh, some uh, questions uh, that uh, be uh, useful for us to hear uh, from each presenter. Um, let, let, let me begin by perhaps asking a more general question. Uh, what is it that you're doing now in partnerships that is different from the ways you did partnerships before? Because all of you, all of us have had partnerships. What is different now? or from now moving forward in terms of um, we, we can start with Professor Traore and then move back. Okay, bon, uh, merci beaucoup. Euh, je dirais simplement euh, pas grand chose, hein, euh, sauf que voilà, depuis que cette histoire de Covid-19 n'est-ce pas a commencé, nous avons, nous nous avons à notre niveau au Mali un programme d'appui au développement n'est-ce pas de l'enseignement supérieur. Nous nous sommes dit et, et nous avons ici chez nous euh, au niveau de notre université un département des sciences de l'éducation. Donc euh, nous nous sommes dit simplement que euh, avec la Covid-19 il faut vraiment changer les pratiques et les stratégies d'enseignement. Donc, euh, et changer, n'est-ce pas, cela reviendrait à inventer, n'est-ce pas, une initiative qui peut permettre aux étudiants de suivre, n'est-ce pas, les cours en dehors de l'université, en dehors, n'est-ce pas, du campus universitaire. Donc, ils restent chez eux à travers, n'est-ce pas, une connexion, soit euh, à l'ordinateur ou bien tout simplement même, n'est-ce pas, au téléphone. Donc, ils peuvent avoir accès, par exemple, aux cours et même avoir accès, n'est-ce pas, à certaines interventions, si vous voulez, des enseignants. Donc, cela ne, pouvait pas se, cela ne peut pas se faire, n'est-ce pas, sans matériel. Donc, c'est pourquoi nous avons sollicité, n'est-ce pas, le PADES. Et le PADES a mis à notre disposition, je pense, 25 ordinateurs. Voilà. Et notre objectif, c'est de, de constituer, n'est-ce pas, une salle de connexion avec le respect, n'est-ce pas, des mesures barrières dans laquelle la salle de connexion des étudiants, n'est-ce pas, seraient là aussi, qui n'ont pas les moyens pour avoir accès, n'est-ce pas, au cours. Voilà. Donc, euh, c'est ce à quoi, n'est-ce pas, nous avons essentiellement pensé. Voilà. Et le PADES, n'est-ce pas, est là, par exemple, pour nous aider dans ce sens-là. Bon, il y a aussi un programme gouvernemental, d'une façon générale, euh, qui va nous aider dans les jours à venir, voilà, à réussir également, n'est-ce pas, euh, cette ambition qui nous caractérise. Thank you. Uh, would any of the panelists want to share something that is uh, different from what we heard from uh, Professor Farrell? And then we can move to other questions. I say something there. Paul, are you hearing me? Paul? Paul, are you hearing me? Okay, uh, if, if the, nobody wants to share that in terms of what it is about partnerships now that are different from the ways in which they organize partnerships, uh, then George we can is, move to George other is trying to get in. Paul. One of the questions uh, on, the, um, uh, on the chat, on the Q&A, uh, is, is there any possibility to bring ICT infrastructure partnerships between institutions? at the regional uh, level. Um, maybe we can ask uh, you know, Professor uh, Igwe to address that one. Thank you, Paul. I've been, I've been trying to raise my hand to answer the previous question. I think both of them are connected. We are trying to... Uh, uh, we, we can't hear Professor Igwe. Can you mute the uh, translation, please? Okay, yeah. Uh, Justin, are you hearing me now? Please, please mute the translation so we can hear Professor Igwe. 
Well, I think you just need to turn off your translation. Are you hearing me now? Are you hearing me now? Yes, go go right ahead. Yeah, I was trying to I was trying to raise my hand when you asked the previous question. Is it yeah, yeah, please go on. Yeah, go yeah, on. What, what I was trying to say is that the new, you things are, the new things we are doing, yes. Uh, you can see was... now you can see now rather than converging in a hall or in a city somewhere in Europe or in Africa to discuss this oh. issue. We are now discussing it for the comfort of our offices. And that is... Uh, Avant, on convergeait vers les autres pays pour trouver des solutions. Et maintenant, new... nous sommes bloqués dans nos bureaux. That is the new thing we've introduced. And we um, we'll ahead to discuss uh, uh, further partnership with telecommunication companies and uh, see how to improve on our bandwidth. And uh, we believe that... Uh, uh, by the time we were, we're able to increase our bandwidth, we'll be able to discuss with some other institutions within the South, South-South Corporation, that have lower bandwidth or that do not have, uh, that cannot afford some of these uh, facilities of Fire City, and see where to cooperate with them in uh, the area of uh, bandwidth sharing and, uh, and ICT facilities. We, I hope you're hearing me, sir. Yes, yes. Please continue. Yeah. So we are talking about, first of all, the new thing with the webinar we have now introduced. At the initial, we, most of us, we are not used to this kind of uh, uh, dialogue, dialogue from the comfort of our offices and our homes. And uh, I was talking about uh, discussing with, uh, with uh, that are ready to, that are ready to partner with us in the area of increasing our bandwidth so that uh, the students and the other people that we are collaborating with will be able to get us from wherever they are, either within the country or outside the country. That is the area of, uh, uh, the area of collaboration that we'll be looking into, area of increasing our bandwidth and making some of these facilities, ICT facilities, affordable to students and even staff, not only students. All right, thank you. Um, a question on the chat is, uh, are there any plans and, or strategies to, uh, to get students back to classroom in our institutions in case the pandemic continues? And tied to that, how do we think the pandemic is affecting student and staff exchange programs? And how can we, uh, you know, as long as the uh, pandemic lasts, uh, ensure that there is collaboration uh, in terms of student and faculty engagement across universities and across borders uh, on the continent? Uh, any of you can take up that question. Well, let me, let me continue from where I stopped. I think uh, the question is, how do we call back students? Well, this is a, it's a, it's an international crisis. And... Um, uh, the, the national oh, government, is, Nigeria, especially in Nigeria, gave the instruction that the schools should be closed down. And we are believing, we are believing that in no distant time from now that students should be able to come back to campus. And when they come back to campus, because we know the students will not continue to stay at home. And when they come back to campus, we are, you know, uh, we are going to develop new teaching methods it may not be, it may not be the physical contact any longer, or it might be a combination of physical contact and uh, distant learning. And uh, as per as per uh, student uh, exchanges, yes. Uh, the other day I was in a in a web webinar with uh, another another organization, and they were talking about splitting splitting exchanges into now maybe two. The first part, staying at home or staying in one's country to do part of the program by this kind of program we are now involved in, by, that's by webinar and teaching from, uh, teaching remotely. And secondly, praying to the Almighty that when the skies uh, opens again, that the second part of the program will be, will be, will be done in uh, collaborating countries. That's what I'm trying to, the theory or the, the hypothesis I'm trying to uh, propound here is that 
some of these exchange programs can be split into two sessions. One session at home and the other session when the sky is open, because we believe the sky will be open and it will be open very soon. When the sky is open, that they will be able now to do the second part of the program in the collaborative country. I think this is what I have to say for now. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and tied to that is the question that uh, was asked before we started the Sorry. meeting. Uh, Can I contribute yeah. on that? Yeah, Can please, I contribute? Professor Kanyama, please continue. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to add on top of what the, the professor said, that in the case of Malawi, uh, today, my deputy vice chancellor is attending a meeting uh, organized by the Ministry of Education, Science and Technology in order to uh, find out uh, if at all we can open and under what circumstances. Our, secondly, our concern is the fact that the, when we closed on the 23rd of March, um, all the international students were kept on campus but in isolation. So it is our hope that very soon we can have a solution as to what exactly to do with this as international postgraduate students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, the, you know, uh, Steve mentioned uh, in his remarks earlier that uh, they are thinking about uh, developing dual degree programs. And there was a question here that was asked, um, and, and uh, those of you from the African universities perhaps can address this. Uh, in terms of what, what are your views on developing dual diplomas and degree programs, and uh, how do you facilitate that uh, with other African universities, but also with universities around the world? Uh, let's start with uh, Professor Kanyama, since I, I can see your face right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this is a very good question. Uh, we have not done much in terms of uh, development of the uh, strategies for the for, for in the face of pandemic. But uh, we are going to take advantage of the re uh, reviewed curricula to adjust it to such a way that uh, there should be more online approaches uh, to teaching than what is happening now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Steve, you want to maybe elaborate a little more on what you had said earlier about uh, these dual degree programs and uh, what you see as some of the uh, you know, opportunities in that space, but also some of the challenges. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I think that these th this question goes hand in hand to some extent with the uh, uh, the infrastructure bandwidth access kinds of kinds of issues and uh, you know we, we all face those even, even here in, in Michigan we're facing uh, issues with our rural communities and with, with some of our uh, lower income families being able to access the, these kinds of opportunities I, I think part of part of the the value of the dual degree type of model is it, it increases the return on investment for investments in the, the bandwidth types of infrastructures and access to, to ICTs because we all want our you know we all want our students to have access to the best faculty but but what if they can do that by staying at home and we all want our, our faculty to have the best labs but what if we don't have to all build those best labs locally what if we can share those labs virtually in, in, to some degree and we want our students to have intercultural experiences and, and be globally globally aware uh, but what if they can get some of those experiences without having to travel halfway around the world? And, and I think if we're innovative in the use of technology and in developing the, these dual degree programs, that uh, we can create the, those those value propositions and and uh, at the same time then enhance the, the priorities to invest in ICTs and, and the bandwidth issues. Uh, thank you. And, and that ties uh, leads to a question that is both on the Q&A uh, as well as that we received earlier. Uh, the one on the Q&A says, um, you know, COVID-19, as we all know, will change the structure of education in Africa and the world over. However, inadequate ICT infrastructure continues to be a great barrier in the application of e-learning. 
what strategies are you putting in place to address this issue so that African universities will not be left behind in the post-COVID-19 delivery of education? And a similar question was asked you know, uh, before the meeting. Uh, and uh, uh, it goes, how can African universities and their counterparts in the developed world collaborate to achieve internet and bandwidth parity? So the issue of you know, in, inequities in, in, in capacities and so on, how do we ensure that this is overcome? Uh, what are some of the measures that can come from the uh, kinds of international partnerships that would help uh, to achieve this? Um, perhaps we can start with uh, Professor Traore. Well, I think Prof. Traore is having some uh, technical difficulties. Okay, um, then let's uh, move to Professor Igwe, if you can share your thoughts briefly. Yeah, I'm making sure Africa is not left behind in terms of infrastructure. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Paul. I think we've been able to make, make our points earlier on. Uh, the, the solution is one, blended teaching. And approaching, like I said earlier on, approaching our, some, of, some of our telecommunication uh, 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 outfits to uh, subsidize, to be able to subsidize students' uh, 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 usage of uh, bandwidth and uh, other ICT facilities. And uh, secondly, uh, you know, in the, uh, for instance, during the, the, the past century, in the 20th century, a number of Nigerians, for instance, got their degrees abroad without, without being abroad to take those degrees. But then that's what they call them by correspondence colleges and correspondence universities. And we believe that if these ICTs, ICT facilities and uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the bandwidth are increased, that we'll be able to accommodate increasing number of students either by, by being physically on campus uh, or being elsewhere and taking the same lecture by what we regard, regarded as a blended uh, program. That is exactly what we want to uh, contribute on that. And uh, on the long term, on the long term, we, we may have to begin to think about increasing our classroom facilities, our hostel facilities, so that this theory, the present theory of uh, call it physical distancing or social distancing will be maintained. Uh, just a few days ago, I was discussing with some of, uh, some of my senior members of staff, and they were talking about converting some of our big halls where we use for events into, into emergency classrooms in order not to crowd the existing classrooms. And those of, uh, because I've read uh, some charts of my staff uh, uh, chatting remotely and asking how do we intend to uh, get this done at the University of Nigeria. And uh, while I was chatting with my, one of my senior member of staff, he was thinking about uh, a host like a core factory, host like uh, the Hall of Fame, the PAA, the Presence Alexandra Auditorium, and all the rest of them, trying now to use them as emergency classrooms, whereby the students will not be clustered as usual, the way they cluster in classrooms. So these are the, these are the you know, strategies being put in place to make sure that when the students come back, uh, that we're able to cope with the, the challenges. Thank you very much. Um, I have a couple more questions, and then we'll, I'll ask the uh, team from MSU to uh, close. And uh, one of the questions that uh, came up, um, both on the Q&A on the, Q &A, on the uh, during this conversation uh, as well as before, and I'll read it the way it was phrased before. Uh, how has the COVID-19 crisis increased disparities and inequalities in countries' education systems on people with disabilities and other marginalized groups? And on the chart, um, the issue of how um, you know, our universities uh, are dealing with marginalized populations, whether in terms of gender, uh, of persons living with disability, or persons that are refugees and displaced people. Um, how, are, how are you dealing uh, with those issues as part of your thinking through uh, productive and mutually beneficial partnerships and collaborations? 
Let's start with Professor Kanyama, Piri. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately uh, for Luana, uh, the impact of COVID on the people with disabilities uh, is not quite uh, there at the moment because we're still in university. We can envisage this will be a big thing where we can also make sure that they are well taken care of. But at the moment, uh, let me say, we wouldn't comment positively on, uh, on what, what, what is being done. Um, Steve, you want to comment on that, how you're dealing with issues of, you know, persons living with disability, um, you know, marginalized communities and so on, uh, because obviously pivoting to online instruction uh, brings particular uh, issues with regards to marginalized communities already. And how can those build, be built into partnerships that uh, assist uh, your partners as well as yourselves? Yeah, I, I think this is a, a really important question and and I think that you know we have we have seen COVID really accentuate the uh, you know, diversity equity and inclusion issues uh, both in the both in the direct impact that it's had uh, uh, on people's lives but but also in some of the indirect uh, impacts through the program that we've had and and uh, you know pre-COVID you know we have you know, lots of resources that, that we engage to to work with persons with disabilities and other marginalized groups and, and make sure they, they have access to all the learning opportunities that, that our students have and, and, all, and, and all the other resources that faculty have. Uh, with COVID though, it was, it was such an abrupt uh, change that you know, basically literally in 24 hours, taking our whole online or taking our whole curriculum online um, and that's that's exactly what happened here. That uh, you know, I, I know that there were there were there were accessibility issues for people. Uh, you know, people sitting in uh, community libraries trying to access Wi-Fi. Uh, accessibility issues in terms of being able to to access the online materials that professors were were, were trying to translate uh, immediately. So, um, you know, I I know we I know that people fell through the cracks and there were unintended impacts of all that because of the speed that had happened. Uh, since then though, as we, as we moved to the summer programming and looking towards the fall, uh, there's been lots of resources put into to training of faculty and, and the uses of technologies to, to help provide access uh, to these underrepresented groups. So oh, is it gonna be perfect? No, but is it gonna be a lot better of what we're doing this summer and in the fall? I think it will be a lot better. Uh, the last question I have is where I started uh, uh, in my own introductory remarks. And there is a question on the Q&A, uh, which I think captures uh, some of that. And, and this, uh, if I can ask each one of you to give your final thoughts in, in uh, a minute or less. Uh, how can we ensure mutually beneficial partnerships amongst grossly unequal partners? Uh, what, you know, how do we do that, uh, whether we're talking of universities or we're talking about other partners? How do we ensure that? What is it that we have to, to do to ensure that this happens? So each one of you can uh, give your final uh, thoughts. Uh, let's start with you, Steve, since you were just uh, speaking. And then we'll move down to Professor Igwe, uh, Professor Kanyama Piri, and, the, and then Professor Traore. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I, you know, I think there's some some critical things. I, I think we, you know, as partners need to come together again around a, a shared problem. And, uh, and, and we, we each bring strengths to those problems and, and perspectives to those problems that's, that's valued. And we, and we need to appreciate those um, various kinds of contributions. Uh, I'll mention AAP again very briefly. And, uh, you know, in this case, you know, it was important to, to make AAP an African-led uh, initiatives. So the, the, the board is actually led by uh, Africans. Uh, there's an African office with, a, uh, with an African uh, uh, director who's helping to, to prioritize things. So, so I, 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 I think and, and you know, really trying to, to help each other learn from each other and build on each other's strengths are, are, are keys. And, and again, not, not push ourselves to do it just because we want to be good partners, but pull ourselves towards important problems that that it takes our collective efforts to solve. Thank you. Um, Professor Igwe? 
Thank yes. you very much. I think uh, the question is, uh, is okay in that um, the universities uh, within the South have, the, have their areas of strength. Huh? The universities have their areas of weaknesses and strength. And uh, it will be beneficial to universities in the South to collaborate in their areas of weaknesses. And uh, in so doing, in so doing, the universities will benefit from the in, from the south south and even north south collaboration. Thank you, Professor Kenyama Piri. Yes, um, I think uh, for us, the best way we can do is to take advantage of com comparative advantages of the institutions. I gave an example of Michigan State and the Ryonge University of Agriculture and Natural Resources, where we think there's a lot to learn from them on the uh, virtual uh, dissemination. But on the other hand, we can also offer the rural setting that they can also learn something. We can also give an example of what was already uh, obtaining uh, with the Makerere University and the University of Nigeria, where we look at their strength and they take advantage and vice versa. Uh, thank you. Uh, Professor Traore, your last thoughts? OK. Bon, euh, moi, je voudrais, avant de répondre à cette question-là, revenir un tout petit peu sur les questions d'inégalité, pour dire que la fracture numérique, là, euh, ce n'est pas simplement une question, si vous voulez, qui concerne les gens, le, les personnes handicapées. Et tout le monde est confronté à ça, en tout cas dans notre pays, parce que notre pays, comme je disais tantôt, est un pays, n'est-ce pas, pauvre. Nous avons d'énormes problèmes, n'est-ce pas, en matière de fracture numérique. Et sachez simplement qu'au-delà de Bamako, au niveau, n'est-ce pas, de mon pays, au-delà de la capitale, souvent la connexion, n'est-ce pas, n'est pas bonne. Donc ça, ça peut handicaper tout le monde. Et un étudiant qui se trouverait dans une autre région aura toujours du mal, par exemple, à se connecter. Donc il y a un accès difficile, si vous voulez, au TIC. Je peux même parler, n'est-ce pas, d'une faillite en ce qui concerne tout simplement l'usage des, des TIC. Mais pour revenir à la question, je pense qu'il faut, pour répondre à un collègue, des salles qui sont suffisamment équipées dans les universités, Le président de la République, il y a deux ans, a donné un ordinateur à tous les bacheliers. C'était, n'est-ce pas, l'objectif. Voilà. Moi, je pense que de telles politiques, on pourrait les reconvertir en construisant, n'est-ce pas, des grandes salles et en équipant, n'est-ce pas, ces salles-là en matériel informatique. C'est tout à fait possible parce qu'on a investi beaucoup d'argent, si vous voulez, dans la dotation de ces bacheliers-là. Donc, une telle politique peut être reconvertie en faveur, n'est-ce pas, des universités. Je crois qu'on peut intervenir aussi au niveau des compagnies téléphoniques. Euh, leur implication serait très, très grande dans la distribution, n'est-ce pas, de la connectivité. Et je pense que si cette implication va jusqu'à la gratuité, ce serait, n'est-ce pas, un pas essentiel pour permettre aux universités, surtout africaines, n'est-ce pas, euh, d'avancer. Je crois aussi qu'entre Sud, Université du Sud, on peut mutualiser, n'est-ce pas, nos efforts. Et comme je disais dans ma petite présentation, voir comment, par exemple, nous pouvons euh, nous approprier, n'est-ce pas, des meilleures expériences. Mais je termine, ça c'est une conviction très profonde, en disant que pour que tout cela se réalise, il faut vraiment qu'il y ait encore... Uh, th uh, thank you, thank you. Um, La mettre en doute du Thank you nom. very much. Thank you. I know, I know uh, you have a lot more thoughts, uh, but in the interest of time, if you don't mind. Yes, thank you very, very much. Um, the, on the Q&A, there are a lot of other questions that have been asked. Unfortunately, we don't have the time uh, to answer them in this particular session. Uh, but the good news is we'll have other sessions. Uh, four more are to come. Uh, some of the issues that have been raised uh, in, those, uh, in the Q&A uh, uh, section uh, deal with uh, how are investors coping with budget cuts, uh, difficult financial uh, climate that is being created by COVID as economies struggle and employment uh, hit, and uh, many people suffer from job losses or uh, salary cuts and, and stuff like that. 
for the budgetary implications uh, of COVID-19 uh, that uh, will be uh, discussed in, in another forum. Um, then there is the issue of student fees. Uh, somebody asked about that. Uh, what are universities doing about student fees? What are they doing in faculty support? Uh, in, in the faculty have had to rise to the occasion to provide education under very difficult circumstances and support staff, of course, are also working very hard uh, mm. together with the, the faculty to do that. Uh, what kind of supports are you providing uh, that the education that can? And again, do that. And then, uh, you know, uh, issues of uh, to what extent can uh, this forum, uh, the AAP, and the universities uh, working as you know, or together with in, in countries or uh, within regions and across the world uh, in certain partnerships, um, you know, look for uh, funding uh, to address some of these issues uh, from intergovernmental agencies, international agencies, and so on and so forth. Uh, funding for infrastructure, IT infrastructure, funding for scholarships, funding for innovations, funding for research, and so on. And then uh, there is a very good point on the Q&A about uh, what are we thinking about what is sustainable return to school? Uh, because obviously when we come back, whenever that is uh, in the different countries and fictions, um, it will not be necessarily returning to the old normal. It will have to be a new normal or what uh, some people call the next normal uh, in which social distancing and maintaining, uh, you know, uh, some of the mitigation measures uh, will continue probably for some time. So what will a sustainable return to school entail? Uh, these are all questions that all of us in the higher education sector have to continue thinking about. And as I said, we'll have opportunities to address some of these questions in our subsequent uh, in forums. Now for uh, today, I want on behalf of the, uh, all the participants in the forum to thank the panelists for sharing with us their institutional experiences uh, with regards to um, what they are doing in general, but also with particular reference to how they uh, see collaborations and partnerships as part of the mitigation measures and how they are trying to transform those partnerships and collaborations uh, into uh, more productive, mutually beneficial taking into account some of the challenges we have faced in the past. This is an opportunity for us to think the future. Uh, once again, thank you to the participants, thank you to the panelists, and now hand it over to the team from MSU uh, to uh, close the meeting. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Richard Mkandawire, coordinator uh, in the background as we close this dialogue, I'd like to express our sincere thank you to Erika and uh, the panelists. Uh, going forward, we're in uh, uh, you know, defining concrete opportunities on collaboration that have arisen from this uh, particular session. Um, most of the critical areas collaboration have been highlighted, uh, you know, beyond, uh, you know, the COVID-19. Uh, we appreciate your contributions. I'd like to assure you that uh, we will collate uh, all these outcomes of these discussions and also we'll share some of the questions as well as our responses to those questions uh, at date. Uh, I would like to announce the next dialogue, which will take place 2020, and the topic is says at higher educational institutions in the age of and lined up with the Vice Chancellor of the University of Pretoria, Professor and the President of MSU, um, uh, Professor Samuel Stanley, and the Vice Chancellor of the University of Dar es Salaam, Professor William as well as uh, Professor Patrick Aua as of Ashanti University in Ghana. So much appreciated for your participation and your contributions. Uh, these dialogues will continue. Thank you very much. <laughs>